was dirt, water, and air. And it was good. Once, Planet Check. Planet Check. Planet Check. Hi, I'm Mama Lady, and this is Planet Check. My special guest today was former director of San Francisco's Department of Environment. He fostered landmark legislation like mandatory composting and recycling. Now he is currently the regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Pacific Southwest, Jared Blumenfeld. Jared, good to see you again. Welcome. Good to see you, Mo. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank good. you for your time. Do you have an average day? I mean, what do you do exactly for the layperson that doesn't know that, that title, Reg Region 9? So EPA was created 40 years ago at a time when America was dealing with things like Love Canal and really tremendously difficult environmental issues. And at the time, um, there was just one EPA and, and less of a field presence. In the, in the 70s, there was a decision to have 10 regional offices throughout the United States, and this is one of them. So we cover from Guam, Hawaii, uh, California, Nevada, and Arizona are the states that we cover. Um, and basically what we do is everything that headquarters would do. So we deal with air issues, we deal with water issues, we deal with very contaminated sites, which are called Superfund sites. Um, we deal with a whole spectrum of environmental issues, but we're slightly closer to where the action is. With your background in international environmental law, Jared, how did you get from there to here? So I started my environmental career, Mo, in 1992 with the Rio Earth Summit. And I'd been at UC Berkeley and studied international environmental law. And I kind of believed that these big international treaties could help save the planet. And I still hope that. Um, but what I found was that most international environmental agreements, whether they deal with biodiversity or the transboundary shipments of hazardous waste or you name it, climate change, all the way through uh, oil spills, most of them aren't really being enforced. Um, and that's a big concern that I had. So the more I spent time, I, I ended up in Washington, D.C. with NRDC looking at the implementation of international environmental agreements. And the track record is very, very poor. So um, then I ended up doing more on the ground work, uh, actually in about 15 different countries, protecting habitat. Uh, ended up bringing a large case against Mitsubishi uh, to stop them building a solar evaporation facility in Laguna San Ignacio, which was the last pristine birthing and breeding ground of the California gray whale. Um, but then what I found was if you do lots of individual projects um, all over the world, it feels international, but what you lack is really working with one community to make them more sustainable. So I was privileged to be offered the job in San Francisco to kind of build an environmental department. Um, and there you can do a lot of things with small communities, neighborhoods, and, and develop a framework for, for international cooperation between cities, but you really need to start with what can cities do themselves. So once we worked out what cities could do themselves, uh, we worked with you and, and thousands of other people to bring together World Environment Day in 2005, where we brought together mayors from the largest 70 cities on the planet um, to come up with a, a framework for what does it mean to be a sustainable city. And, and unlike countries, cities have a lot in common. They all have transportation needs. They all write their own building codes. They all need to pick up the garbage. They all need to supply their citizens with clean drinking water. All those things are exactly the same whether you're in New York or New Delhi. Um, and that was kind of, for me, really the birth of the urban environmental movement. Um, but then I kind of reached my uh, capacity point within the city and county of San Francisco. We had written 19 laws, starting with the precautionary principle, going all the way through mandatory composting and recycling. And there probably are maybe two or three more laws to write. But the goal here is to scale some of those initiatives throughout Region 9 that has 47 million people. We have four of the largest 10 cities in the United States, and 24 of the largest 100 cities in the United States are right here in the region. So we've already been meeting with mayors um, from Mayor Villaraigosa in LA. We just met with Chuck Reed in San Jose um, to start that conversation, uh, Mayor Phil Gordon in, in uh, Phoenix. So we're starting to think about how, do, how does EPA play a role in, in the city scale? Going back to just uh, being local and with this new administration, uh -huh. bringing the protection back and the right. Environmental Protection Agency, 
I know high on your list is accountability. So what is your vision for those communities that are normally victims of environmental injustice? So this administration said three very simple things to begin with that don't seem revolutionary and don't seem like they should have to be said, but were really important given the political context in which we found ourselves at the beginning of the Obama administration. The first is that the rule of law is going to actually mean something. When, when laws have been broken, uh, when pollution has been allowed to occur that violates the laws of the land, we're going to enforce those laws and bring judicial action. Um, the second is that science should mean something. So when you have an independent advisory committee tell you that ozone standards should be ratcheted up in our, uh, in our cities and across the nation, you don't then do something else. You listen to science and you take serious action as a result. And thirdly, that we want to be open and transparent. Um, and that transparency really, uh, if it doesn't exist, further erodes trust in government and, and the, those environmental laws and science. So making sure that we bring daylight into EPA, into all the decisions that we make is, is critical. And then really look at the most disadvantaged communities across our country. Um, most people don't realize this. I was kind of shocked when I first realized it, that if you look at any map of the United States, you can, you can say where the poorest people live happens to also be where the most toxic and contaminated sites across our country are, where our wastewater treatment facilities are, where our underground storage tanks are, where our Superfund sites are. And so it's, it's really kind of a crime that because people are poor or come from communities of color, they should be burdened with all these negative attributes of our society. And on the flip side, they have none of the benefits. So they don't have the parks, they don't have the recreation centers, they don't have all the things that government pays for, museums or good public transportation. So there's a whole section of our society that, that is burdened from a health perspective and also doesn't have those benefits. And I think EPA and especially uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson is, is incredibly committed to, to try and do our part to reverse that injustice.